All right, let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope that you all had a great weekend. I know that there was a really weird smell in Ackerman that you might still be catching with us to some extent. Uh, it is not team spirit, it's some piping that's in the basement. So apparently there's um, just some issues with the piping down there. So um, I saw that email this morning about it and I was like, it is such a Monday to have that going on. So um, my understanding is that the doors to Ackerman are being opened and aired out and they're in the process of getting all of that taken care of. So just to let you know about all that fun stuff, uh, again, it's a, uh, Fun way to start a Monday and start the week, but it should be completely gone over the course of the day. So um, we're going to start with another of those practice questions that connect to some of the things that we talked about last class. Uh, so last class, we talked about locus of control and emotional intelligence, which would be examples of what? Um, either A, cognitive dispositions, B, attachment styles, C, communication dispositions, or C, socio-communicative dispositions. Take a second, look back through your notes, uh, think about this question, and then we'll talk about it together in just a little bit. Anybody who would like some more time on this question? All right. What is a locus of control? Yes. So that would be one extreme. Yeah. Somebody else who's starting to talk about it? Yes. It's like your uh, perception of how much control you have over them. Right. So um, on one extreme, right, we have an external locus of control or feeling that the world is chaos. I don't have control over my life or of my actions, right? Um, so one example of this would be to say, um, I am going to study and work really hard for this test. And if I study and do a good job preparing, I can get an A. That would be the idea of an internal locus of control, feeling like you can control your destiny and actions. An external locus of control would be saying, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I work, I'm going to get a C no matter what, right? It's out of your hands. So um, we approach and think about our communication with other people based on an internal or external locus of control. What about emotional intelligence? What is emotional intelligence? How much you understand your own emotions? Okay. I hear the back. Yeah. So how much you understand your own emotions is part of it. Another part, right, is understanding and processing the emotions of other people. So if somebody is emotionally intelligent, they might say to themselves, oh, I'm really on edge because I'm stressed because I have a big exam coming up this week, right? 
Um, another sign of emotional intelligence would be if you're talking to somebody and they seem really upset and sad, right? You're not going to be talking about your weekend for 10 minutes. You're going to adjust your communication and say, hey, you seem a little bit upset. What's going on, right? So that's another part of emotional intelligence is understanding how other people are doing and being able to read other people's emotions. So locus of control and emotional intelligence, these two things are parts of what? So uh, how many people think A, cognitive dispositions, B, attachment styles, C, communication dis dispositions, or D, socio-communicative? The correct answer here is A, cognitive dispositions. Um, I mentioned on Friday that one of the ways to think about cognitive, right, is to think about cogs turning in your brain, right? Kind of like a watch and all the gears that it has. Your brain is kind of turning through and parsing out information. So how you think about and approach the world, right, will be your cognitive disposition. Do you think that you're in control of your life? Can you understand the emotions of those around you? Those are cognitive dispositions. Attachment styles are the four that we went over, um, which are preoccupied, fearful, dismissing, and secure, right? So that wouldn't be the best answer here. Communication dispositions are things that we talked about in the group activity where um, it might be a range from introverted to extroverted. It might be verbally aggressive or assertive, right? That would be how we choose to communicate with other people. And then socio-communicative dispositions are how we approach communication. For example, if somebody is narcissistic or Machiavellian, right, we might approach communication in a self-centered or selfish way. Right, so as mentioned, cognitive dispositions such as emotional intelligence might involve how we use, understand, and perceive emotions. And then there's a couple other examples there of cognitive dispositions as well. Okay. We talked about that last class. Uh, we also talked about these ideas of personality and temperament, how things like personality shape the ways that we communicate. Also, uh, dispositions and how our own approaches uh, to communication inform our relationships with other people. Before we get started today, I do want to provide a couple reminders and resources for you. Um, so uh, if you look at the Canvas page for this course, um, I've included something that a couple people asked for that hopefully you'll be of use. Uh, the first thing is that I included answers and correct responses to that writing activity that we worked on last week uh, so that you can refer back to that for your own reference. Um, so APA style uh, and some of these other answers. So if you want to ever refer back to that as you're working on writing assignments, that's there. Um, also, uh, we did a group activity during the first week where we went over the five different types of communication under that pyramid from interpersonal to uh, mediated and group communication. A couple of people asked if the notes from those uh, could be shared with the class as a whole. So I decided to compile uh, the work that you did for that activity and upload that there too. Um, so you'll be able to refer back to that as needed. Um, if you're interested in group communication a bit more, I know that you're probably starting to talk with your advisor about the winter. I teach small group communication this winter face-to-face. -face, um, so we'll be getting into kind of teamwork, uh, work in larger groups. So if that's an area you're interested in, um, we pick up on that discussion in that class. Um, the next thing that I wanted to direct you to is to the midterm that is starting to come up. And I want to uh, let you know to put that on your radar, right? So uh, this week, our focus is on verbal and nonverbal communication. So we'll be looking at both of those and breaking those down. Um, next week, we'll be looking at culture uh, and starting to break down culture, right? And then the following week, week five, is the midterm. So uh, the midterm is covering content from the first four weeks of the term. Um, I also will provide you with a study guide. Uh, this Wednesday, I'd like to give you a study guide at least two weeks prior so that you know what to expect, right? So the study guide will go over things we've already talked about and things that we will be talking about the rest of this week and next week so that you can start to refer back to that. I'll have some practice questions available for you to work on in addition to the ones that we do at the beginning of class. Um, as a reminder, uh, we do not have any class meetings on that Wednesday and Friday, the 26th or 28th. Um, the midterm is not something that you take uh, in class, it's not a closed note or closed book or like uh, you have to take it during the class period type of exam, right? It's open note. 
open book and I don't hold class on these days because I want you to have the time and space to take it at the time of day or the situation that works the best for you uh, without having to worry about scrambling to make it class um, to take the exam. So um, we'll do on that Friday midterm review going over the things to prepare for the exam. That Wednesday and Friday we don't meet. Uh, that three-day window to take the exam is between that Wednesday and Friday. Uh, so just know that that window will be your opportunity to do that. So um, again, just wanted to put on your radar that that's coming up. Uh, and then the other thing is just the Canvas prompts. As a reminder, if you've not completed any Canvas prompts yet, you'll need to complete these next six out of eight. Uh, remember that if you completed more than six, then I'll grade your top six. Um, this week's Canvas prompt is up. It's kind of fun. Uh, you get to see a clip from the movie Wally. We talk about nonverbal communication. Um, and um, I'm in the process of grading and working through uh, the Canvas prompt number twos, and those uh, should be returned to you by Wednesday. Uh, your grades and feedback on the first Canvas prompts are up. Um, and then the last thing is I do have the attendance records updated through the end of last Friday, but I know that there is one group who did not uh, send or email me their attendance activity. Um, so please get that to me if you are part of that group that still uh, needs to get that turned in. Uh, just as a reminder, right, I calculate attendance uh, through either individual or group attendance uh, activities that you work on. So please make sure to turn those in or email them to me um, to make sure that I can keep your attendance records up there. So um, many of you are already doing that. I appreciate that. Just wanted to put on your radar. That's how I look at that material. All right. Any questions about anything we went over last class, anything in general about the course at this point? So today, uh, we are moving on to verbal communication. So we'll be talking about language, why language matters, and starting to look at how we use language to communicate about issues. If you think back to the definition of communication, communication is the use of symbols to convey meaning. So the way that we use language plays a really big part here in how it is that we choose to understand each other. In fact, especially by using things such as texting, uh, sending emails and so on, right? We're constantly using language to try to make sense of meaning and to get better at language when we're working with each other. So um, what I'd like us to do to start things out for today is uh, for you to find somebody in the class, um, ideally somebody that you haven't met with or worked before on a group assignment. So you're welcome to move around a little bit if you'd like. And what I'd like you to do with this person, uh, you can form a group of three as well, is to take some time to share a little bit about your experience at EOU, for instance, how your weekend was, how you're liking your classes, what it's like living here. Um, you can hit on some additional things, um, talk about more things if you'd like. Um, but what I would like you to do is, as you're listening to your partner share and talk about uh, their experience, I want you to take some notes about some of the words and phrases that you notice your partner saying, right? They're using the word like a lot. They're talking about it being awesome. Take note of the words and phrases that are coming up, especially frequently. Um, so take some time to find somebody to work with, uh, share a little bit about uh, your weekend and how you're doing. Um, and as you're hearing the other person speak, take some notes about what you're noticing. Oh. 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 Oh.
What's up? Oh, yeah, go for it. another minute or two to continue your conversation and make sure you've got a few words from your partner. Okay, so go ahead and wrap up your conversation and return back to your regular seats. I'll hang on to this paper now. So um, I did this activity with my morning class and I was looking at them. There was a student who said, my partner was telling me about how all their classes suck and I couldn't help but feel a little sad. It's all good. Um, so thank you for taking the opportunity to chat a little bit with your partner. Um, I know that we've had some exciting things happen over the weekend. Uh, football team traveled to Montana. Um, a lot of athletic extracurriculars are starting to do some fun stuff. Um, so I think it's good to catch up, but I also wanted you to do this to pay attention to uh, language and start to track how we use language in unique ways to make sense of our communication. So hang on to this. I'm gonna ask you to return to this uh, list of words that you came up with for the end of class. So what you heard and started to pick up on, right, is verbal communication. 
So verbal communication is another one of those things like interpersonal communication, where I think it's a good idea to really clearly define what it is and what it isn't. So verbal communication is how we use language and other symbols to communicate with, what, with each other. So one of the easy ways to think about the difference between two is that verbal communication is what you say and nonverbal communication is how you say it, right? So um, you're getting a pizza, right? It's the same pizza. You could just get it through delivery. Um, you could actually go in to local harvest and get it, or it could be du jour, right? So the actual pizza versus how it delivers is nonverbal versus verbal. Um, picture here on the right, if you um, have taken geometry, calculus, algebra, you're taking it right now, uh, the dreaded pi symbol, right? This is an example of verbal communication, because if you say, um, I want to know pi, or I know pi, right, you spell it P-I, well, those two letters together, right, create verbal communication. They're using language um, as a means of symbols to communicate. But also the pi symbol here on the right uh, is a way of standing in and symbolizing um, that number, right? And I know that number is very long, 3.14159. Uh, people literally do contests where they memorize as many of the decimal points of uh, pi as they can. It, it would be really inefficient to list that massive number every single time you were referring to pi. So we have uh, pi, or we have the pi symbol as a way of simplifying our communication verbally, right? So verbal communication would involve either of those two things, the pi letters uh, or the pi symbol to communicate and engage with each other. So verbal communication, something we do all the time. Is sending a text verbal communication? How many people say yes? How many people say no? So sending a text would be considered verbal communication because verbal communication can be both spoken and written, right? So verbal communication means that it is using the language. So in this case, right, verbal would mean you are writing, sending a message, structuring a message through sentences and so on, right? Um, if you uh, are sending emojis, that would even be considered verbal communication because you're using symbols to stand in for or represent. Yeah. Are you saying verbal communication can be absolutely any text or, or only text that conveys a message or meaning or it's something that we're trying to convey? So it needs to convey meaning, right? So if meaning is not understood, then it wouldn't meet the definition of communication. It would just be noise. So right? if you just like don't understand a text, it's that it's not verbal communication. Like yeah, if you don't understand it, right, then it's not being communicated, right? right. So you could get a distorted message or there might be very small snippets that you get, right? But it's, if we're thinking about sender receiver, right? It's not being received yeah. in a way that's comprehensible. Right, so it has to be understood to be considered verbal. Yes, okay. right? So if, um, you know, you're at a train station in a foreign country and you're hearing people speak in different languages that you don't follow, right? That wouldn't necessarily fit communication for you. Okay. Yeah, so good question. So verbal communication, right, can fit um, as long as it's using language. What about smiling at somebody? How many people think that's verbal communication? Not verbal communication? Correct. So smiling at somebody would not be verbal communication. It's nonverbal, right? That fits under the definition of how you say it. So using a gesture such as nodding, right, or smiling uh, is a way of nonverbally uh, supplementing, supporting, contradicting, or otherwise adding to the verbal message. We'll get to that a bit more later this week, um, but smiling would not be verbal. <clears throat> what about American Sign Language or ASL? Um, is this verbal communication? Many people say yes. Yeah, so ASL is in fact uh, verbal communication because it's using gestures to create symbols to communicate, right? It's conveying information through the use of gestures. And not only do those gestures symbolize letters, uh, but you have a very complex and really unique vocabulary that builds out through the use of ASL. Um, so one thing that I find interesting is the fact that uh, under ASL, there's actually different accents um, and ways that you can recognize different patterns of communicating 
um, that we might not think about. We might think that ASL is pretty global. Yeah. I would probably be silly again, but if you like point, is that communication? So um, no silly or bad questions, right? You're welcome to ask. Um, so pointing would be number, right? It would be the use of a gesture. It doesn't stand in for language, right? It's not standing in for letters. It's just standing in for um, you should look over there. All right. Okay. So it fit under the definition of nonverbal communication. So this example here, um, sign language, right, um, is kind of unique in the ways that it uh, uses different elements and styles depending on the person. So I think that's pretty interesting, right? The idea here that um, the verbal element of using a sign, right, um, is one part of it, but the nonverbal part is how the speed at which you sign, um, the way that some of the signs could look a little bit different based on factors like age. That's what we would put more in the nonverbal category, right? Somebody's accent uh, would be an example of nonverbal communication. So, um, Right, language has what are known as rules. <clears throat> and I think that differentiating these rules is something that many of us just do on autopilot. And I think breaking down these different rules is a really good way to understand effective communication. Right. Um, so uh, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago that's about like building good grammar skills and all of that. And the book is called Each Shoots and Shoots. And I think that the title is pretty silly and pretty clever. Um, the premise, right? Uh, of this book about punctuation and grammar is that a panda walks into a bar, the panda eats, shoots, and loses, right? Um, and depending on how we interpret that sentence, right, we can say that the panda walks into a bar, right? And if there are commas between those words, we say, well, the panda eats, right? It has its meal. It shoots, like it has a gun, and it starts firing the gun up in the air. Uh, and then it leaves and physically and exits the bar. That's a pretty wild sight. Um, it sounds like the newest DreamWorks movie or something about like a panda secret agent or something, right? But that's probably not what you would expect a panda to do if you heard that sentence. Um, in fact, um, it's more likely that you would see this sentence without the use of commas, right? You would say that a panda eats, shoots, and leaves. Shoots being plants leaves also being plants, right? The idea that that's a panda's natural diet. The use of commas and punctuation matters, right? It's important because the presence or absence of commas in that sentence drastically changes our understanding or interpretation of that sentence. However, right, uh, if you saw a sentence where it says the panda eats, shoots, and leaves, um, and you saw that it had commas, you might think to yourself that somebody just um, had incorrect punctuation and just did not structure the sentence correctly because pandas don't have opposable thumbs. It doesn't make sense that they would be um, actually shooting something like a gun, right? Um, so we use rules of language to try to make sense of and understand uh, sentences and communicate with each other on that basis. 
One thing that I have noticed in the Canvas prompts to continue to work on, right, is using commas to separate clauses and sentences. So for instance, you might say, for example, I went to the store, right? Using a comma after for example is a way to ensure that rules of language are being used effectively um, to enhance your own writing. So when it comes to language, what we have here is the semantic or dictionary definition. In other words, depending on the context or situation, right, the dictionary definition you're applying is going to look a little bit different. In other words, are shoots or leaves referring to the vegetables, uh, plants, et cetera, right? Or is it referring to uh, shooting, right? The act of shooting a gun or leaving a uh, premises. So the semantic definition that you're using is going to be different depending on the grammar, punctuation, et cetera, and sentence. So we're choosing the dictionary definition that we want. If you were to say something like, um, I need pie, right? We would probably interpret that to mean that you need like a really nice slice of Mary and Mary pie, and you're gonna go to Denny's at 1 a.m. or something like that, right? Um, so um, that might be semantic, but if you're studying for an algebra test and you say, I need pie to a friend, maybe you're working on an equation and you need them to tell you what pie is, right? You start reciting the numbers so that you can punch that in. So the semantic definition we use depends on the situation. We also have syntactic, right? So syntactic refers to how we use grammar, structure, and punctuation to understand words. Again, each two leaves is a perfect example. There's also an example in your textbook um, that called uh, uh, that says "Let's eat, comma grandma" versus "Let's eat grandma," right? Um, and that's kind of a silly example because you would use the comma to say "Let's eat, grandma." to indicate that you are going to enjoy a meal uh, with your grandma, right? And um, you're not going to Jeffrey Dahmer your grandma, right? So let's eat grandma is separated by a comma to help to indicate the sentence structure and meaning. And then lastly, we have this idea of pragmatic. So we use pragmatic rules to understand the situation, right? Um, so if you were to say something like, uh, let's eat grandma, right? And you forgot the comma, people might read that and say, well, you just forgot the comma, right? Uh, we don't think you're going to eat grandma, right? You're trying to make that sentence uh, make sense to you based on what you know about the person, and you assume that they're a good person who doesn't cannibalize on you, right? Um, there's another example in the book that says that human beings are our secret ingredient, and it's a company that's advertising baked goods, right? The idea, of course, is that the interpretation of that sentence could be a little bit off. Um, and so we use context and rules to make sure we understand the sentence properly. So um, I brought up this example last week, but there is an indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest called Piraha, who um, are famously known to be enumerate. That is, they do not have words to describe large quantities of numbers. Um, communication shapes reality, right? The reason that I got into communication studies is because I'm fascinated by this idea that how we think, right, how we behave, how we look at the world is shaped by how we communicate. So the use of verbal language is a way by which we can understand and make meaning. I wanted to show a short clip that goes over uh, Piraha and some of the ways in which um, their language is shaped in a very different way. As Never began to realize something was missing. The Piraha have no words for the common, no words for the future tense, and in criminal, the Piraha have no words. Right. So to me, that's fascinating. This idea that like there are a few hooks, there are some hooks, there are several hooks. Right. Um, a member of the Pierha group was interviewed talking about her children. Right. And um, while she didn't have a number to describe the number of children she had, she did explain and express her feelings of love and support for children, both individually and collectively. Right. So the way that we think about and process information looks different across cultures and contexts. I think this is a good example of how um, we might understand things differently on the basis of how we choose to communicate and how cultures develop their own languages. 
Uh, a really good example that's brought up in the book uh, is that in Japan, there is no word equivalent for backyard. And part of why that is, is because in Japan, right, there's higher population density, the homes are a lot smaller, and most homes do not have space for a backyard. So it doesn't make sense for there to be a word for something that doesn't really exist or normally doesn't exist in that context. Um, one kind of fun thing to do is uh, there are all sorts of German words to describe very specific experiences and feelings. Um, for instance, if you're familiar with the word schadenfreude, that's the feeling of pleasure that you have at somebody else's suffering. So if you were a sociopath and you think schadenfreude is great, right, there's a word for that in German. Um, so different languages have words that cannot easily be translated and processed over because they're exp expressing thoughts and ideas that might differ across different cultures. So um, the use of language to shape reality is shaped by culture, is shaped by how languages develop. There's also what's known as levels of abstraction or the abstraction level. Um, so if we think about communicating with other people, right, we have two goals and at times these two goals can be in tension with each other. Goal number one is that we're trying to communicate clearly, right? We want to make sure that people understand the precise things that we're trying to say. Uh, the second thing that we're trying to do is to communicate precisely. If we didn't communicate uh, without like spending a paragraph saying a simple thing, right? Other people wouldn't understand us very much. So we try to keep it concise enough that people can follow along, we don't waste their time, and specific enough that they understand what it is that we're trying to say. So for instance, language could be very abstract. We could say information. Could be very concrete and say interpersonal communication. So if somebody asked you what classes you were taking, you could say, I'm taking an information class. That's very broad, right? Or maybe a little bit more specific, I'm taking a class in the humanities college. Or maybe I'm taking a communication class, right? Um, every time you talk to your friend about your classes, you're not saying, oh, yes, well, um, we talked today about uh, in Palm 002, uh, interpersonal communication with Dr. Benjamin Mann, which meets Monday, Wednesday from 12, 12 50 p.m. Um, we talked about the abstraction ladder, and Ben made a weird joke about Dr. Dahmer, right? Like, you know use that vivid description and paragraph every single time, right? You're altering how abstract and concrete you are, and oftentimes you become more abstract in your communication with somebody as you develop a code and a shared sense of that, with that person about things. We have a lot of inside jokes, references we might make that are a bit abstract or uh, not accessible to somebody else. Maybe you're uh, getting ready for a big interview for a nonprofit, right? And the first time you talk about it, you talk about gearing up for this big interview for a nonprofit in Eastern Oregon. Uh, and after that, you might get more abstract and say, well, I'm getting ready for an interview. So if we think about the role of noise in understanding and making sense of communication, right? Noise can sometimes come in um, if it feels like the level of abstraction does not match what the other person knows and understands about you. You could forget. Uh, what that interview was even about, so you missed the part of the message due to the level of abstraction that they used. So words, in addition to that, right, also carry different purposes. Um, so words are meant to do different things. Um, one thing you might be very familiar with if you've taken a class in English is this idea of denotative versus connotative meaning, right? So denotative meaning um, if somebody says that they went out on a date with a weasel, right, the denotative dictionary definition would be, oh, you actually went on a date with a weasel. How did that go, right? Um, did they eat all the fish? Uh, a connotative meaning would be um, to use weasel as a term of art to describe somebody that's a bit manipulative or shifty or untrustworthy, right? We're not using the dictionary definition. We're using the cultural definition or slang that we might be giving uh, in a given situation. So denotative and connotative meetings are important things to distinguish in our communication, something that we very often do, right? We communicate for both instrumental and relational goals. A really easy way to think about this is to think back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We communicate for instrumental goals when we say, I need a glass of water or I need to go to the bathroom, right? Um, we're fulfilling those really core needs at the bottom of the pyramid. But regulatory or relational functions might be about communicating love and belonging. We might say, hey, are you doing okay? Or I'd love to hang out with you this evening, right? That would be regula regulatory use of language. We also use uh, 
personal function, right, or intrapersonal communication um, as a way of utilizing language as well. For instance, um, say uh, you're on the way to class and you decide to um, start singing along to one of your favorite songs. Uh, maybe you've got a little Carly Ray Jepsen going and you're using that to get uh, yourself started and pumped for the day. Uh, that would be an example of a personal function that would use the language. There are also what is known as heuristic functions. Uh, so a heuristic is uh, kind of a resource that you use to help you to remember things. So one example of a heurism that you might use is PEMDAS. So if you're in algebra or math class, right? PEMDAS is an acronym that helps you to remember the order at which you complete equations, starting with parentheses and going forward from there. Um, so that would be an example of heuristics. Another example was the one I brought up earlier, right? Cognition, like cogs turning in your brain, might be a way that you help to remember that. So we use heuristic functions all the time. It's especially helpful if you're gearing up for an exam to use heuristics and language to help you out there. There's also what are known as representational functions to help us request or use information, right? So we'll oftentimes use language in order to seek out uh, different pieces of information that we need. Uh, so for instance, maybe you're in a Zoom class and uh, the professor has gone 30 minutes with their microphone muted and they have like tried to talk for 30 minutes but no student has heard the message, they might have uh, an influx of messages in the Zoom chat uh, because um, you have students who are using a representational function to tell that professor, hey, uh, you're muted, we can't hear you. Um, and every time I say that, I have to just double check. Okay, we're not muted, we're good, okay. Um, so that might have happened to you at some point in the class, but that would be an example of using a representational function. So if we abide by the idea that language shapes reality, right, the languages that we develop help us to mentally organize and make sense of our experiences and make those experiences tangible, the question becomes, well, who has created language? How has language been formed? Right? Who benefits from language? One thing we see a lot in a lot of political and social debate and discussion is a question about language and the way that language evolves and is being used, right? Language is always changing, it's always dynamic. Um, Mirror and Webster is always updating its dictionary, it's updating its terminology. It comes up with new words every year that adds to the dictionary, right? Um, so, because language is changing, Language is designed in a way that oftentimes privileges or benefits uh, dominant groups, groups that have control of establishing or creating the language. And people who might be a part of a subservient group or muted group find themselves in a position of feeling like their language or lived experience is not necessarily understood or represented in the same way, right? We can have all sorts of debates and discussion about what language is or is not appropriate to use, uh, what does or does not fit under a muted group. Um, but I think for the purposes of this class, it's useful to understand that not all language is created equal, right? A good example here is the use of gendered language, right? Uh, language that could be racist or sexist. Uh, one example is the use of the term chairperson uh, or chair, right? Oftentimes in the past, the word used was chairman. Um, and it started to become really odd when it would say chairman Nicole, right? Um, so chair or chairperson was started to be used as a gender neutral alternative, uh, recognizing that many chairs are women, right? So um, that would be an example of how muted group theory might shape uh, what might be seen as an otherwise gender neutral term. I'll give you an example of muted group theory in action. Um, so if we think about the legacy of colonialism and exploitation and violence against, against indigenous and first nation peoples, right? Uh, one thing that was discussed in British expansion of indigenous land and territory was a notion of what land or territory even was and what that meant. Uh, for a lot of indigenous peoples, um, the idea that land was a commodity or a thing that somebody could own or use or have was not something that was understood or made sense to a lot of um, tribes and groups at the time, right, land was seen as a thing that exists, a thing that we reside in, and not something that could be owned or possessed by people. So there was significant uh, disagreement and lack of understanding between colonizers and indigenous people on the basis of what land was 
and a dominant group that viewed land as a commodity or thing to own versus a muted group that did not understand or think about land in the same way, right? The way that we shaped or thought about language as a thing to own very much shaped how different groups approached this differently. We also have what are known as language titles, right? So um, language can range from very formal to informal. So how you talk about, uh, you know, your classes with your best friend uh, versus your grandma, assuming that you didn't eat her, right, are going to be very different things. Uh, so formality of language is one factor that's going to be measured a little bit differently. Jargon, right, jargon is the use of very specialized or technical language. So um, I was involved in debates. There was a lot of jargon and slang that was being used in debate, right? For instance, we'd say things like topicality, counterplan, a priori, net benefits, a lot of terms that you wouldn't understand if you weren't in the same activity. If you're involved in an extracurricular or group, there's a good chance you have that specialized language too. But a lot of outsiders might feel alienated by it if they're not a part of the group. So there are uh, colloquialisms, right? Phrases like have a field day, where it's using figurative language or phrasing. I'm not saying that you should go put on a jersey and play capture the flag outside. It might elicit memories for some of you, right? I'm saying you should have a good time. Uh, so that might be the use of colloquialisms. Slang, right, is the use of language that is specific uh, to a population or group, right? So the use of gendered uh, or of Gen Z language as the way that slang has developed. Um, so in, for instance, saying that a uh, song slaps, right? It's not saying that a disembodied hand exists in the song and is slapping you, it's saying the song is good, right? Or, you know, another example uh, of slang uh, is, you know, you might refer to somebody as a daddy and that person is uh, not necessarily your father. No good. We also have idioms, right? Expressions or figures of speech. So you might use an idiom, um, an example of this would be to say, for instance, um, like my dad likes to say, um, let's make like frog eyes and bug out of here, right? Uh, silly, doesn't make sense. You're not actually frogs, right? It's using a figure of speech to convey uh, language. Biased language is language that's for or against a certain group. So saying chairman uh, rather than chair uh, would be an example of that. We also have ambiguous language, right? Language that could mean different things for different people. Saying something like, I need pie, right? Is it referring to uh, a baked good? Is it referring to 3.14, 159? Um, that's ambiguous language. If you're ever looking for ambiguous language, watch a White House press conference. Um, regardless of party, right? A press secretary is oftentimes charged with being ambiguous because they don't want to commit to positions or statements that are seen as outside of um, how a candidate or president is trying to communicate. Um, and then lastly, we have euphemisms, right, which is intentionally making something less clear on the basis of culture or norms of a specific group. I'll give you an example on TikTok, right? So um, oftentimes people using TikTok will try to get past algorithms that might flag information uh, or words that would be otherwise seen as against their terms of service and guidelines, right? So saying words like death or suicide would be seen as outside of the guidelines, might make you banned, might make your content no longer appear. So as you might know, right, a lot of people who use TikTok will use the phrase unliving instead, which gets past the algorithms, right? So oftentimes there's a lot of euphemisms for death, there's a lot of euphemisms for sex, I'm sure there's books about that, Right, but we use language to be less direct and less clear about certain issues. So, given that, I want you to just take another, take a minute or two to look through the words that you wrote down at the beginning of class, and then just take a moment to jot down next to them where you might categorize these words uh, based on these categories that we talked about.
So we've spent some time today talking about some of the ways that we use verbal communication, right? Including its ambiguities and conveying of information. We're getting into nonverbal communication for next class. Uh, once you have finished working through some of these categories, you're welcome to tap forward or email me your activity for today. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Um, hopefully the smell will be gone soon and I'll see you again for Wednesday's class. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, oh, perfect. So, yeah, I have like the notes on the back of it. So, okay, um, I will take a that was everybody in your group? Uh, yeah, except for my name. Okay, no problem. Got it. Yeah, just out of curiosity, if yeah. you're someone that likes the comics ID or BC, I don't think I've heard or I've heard of that 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 was XCD or whatever that comic is, but I don't know the other group. All right, they're they haven't they've been they're like you know. 40s to 50s, a little bit in the 60s, but there. I'll bring in one you can look at. But yeah. a lot of what you learned in, or you're discussing today in class is like those are exactly what these are based off of, like how we. Like, yeah, so yeah bring them in, and I uh, I might use them in my slides next time. Like one that I was reading last night, like uh, you're just I don't understand the comic. It's from an era that you know, like it's yeah, like, but they're discussing like. How many does he have? You? I think you lost one. <laughs> That's the thing, right? You you take a communication class and you can't like unsee things after that. Like you you know, you know you're you're reading a comic, you're watching a movie or whatever, and like you can't turn that off. <laughs> uh, that's great. I love it. Um, yeah, feel free to share that.